وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد بن عبد الله صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار Brothers and sisters, inshallah ta'ala today we're going to start a series which we called it Practical Steps in which you could save your family from the hellfire and inshallah ta'ala this revolves around the ayah Ya ayu al-ladheena amanu qu anfusakum wa ahlikum nara wa quduha al-nas wa al-hijara alayha malaikatun ghilaadun shidaadun la ya'asoon allaha ma amarahum wa yaf'aloon ma yu'maroon the ayah is in surah al-tahreem ayah 6 so this inshallah ta'ala uh, series that we're starting is going to revolve around the tafsir and the explanation uh, of this particular uh, ayah, inshallah ta'ala. Before I go into the topic at hand, I wanted to start by saying that having a family, having a family, whether it be brothers, whether it be sisters, whether it be children, having a wife, and having parents, it is all one of the greatest min min it is from the one of the greatest worldly uh, blessings allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he gives and that he bestowed upon us subhanahu wa ta'ala imagine you came to this world and you had no one you're alone you have no shoulder to cry over you have no one to tell your secrets to you have no one to converse with all of these are min tabarak wa ta'ala it is from the blessings of allah that you have a family to be part of. And so what is required from us when Allah bestows a blessing onto us? What is it that is needed for us from us in response to this blessing? What is needed from us is that we come with gratitude. A shukr, gratitude to the one who blessed us with this particular blessing and has allowed us to have a wife and children and parents and brothers and sisters. And how is it that we should come with gratitude? How should we come with a shukru in this particular issue? The way that we should come with it, it is to deal with our families, our brothers, our sisters, our parents, our wives, our children, that we should deal with them ala ma amar ash-shara, in the way that the Sharia legislated. And that inshallah ta'ala is what the lecture is about. Practical steps, practical steps in which we can respond to the blessing Allah has given us subhanahu wa ta'ala and how we can benefit them from them ikhwa is that we teach them or we strengthen them with or we guide them towards learning beneficial knowledge also aiding them to come with righteous actions warning them from things that will harm their religion and even their worldly, worldly affairs, whatever would harm it. This is from the suwar of shukr, it's from the forms of how gratitude can be expressed to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this would be, ya ikhwah, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will then say, Allah will then save for you the blessing that He's given you. Through this shukr that you've expressed and you've shown, Allah will protect for you the blessing that you have. He will allow that blessing to remain with you. How, would it, how is it that Allah is going to allow the blessing of family remain with us? Is that Allah will allow you, them to reunite with you on the hereafter. As he said, وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Those of you who believe, وَاتَّبَعَتْهُمْ ذُرِّيَّتُهُمْ And their family followed them. بِإِيمَانٍ They followed them in belief. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, أَلْحَقْنَا بِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ we will make their families catch up with them and be with them. And so what they did was they made, they made sure that their family were righteous and upright and steadfast. And then what happened was they helped their families deal by doing what? By telling them to take on beneficial knowledge and righteous actions. So when they showed that shukr and they came with that, their families took it on board. And when their families took it on board, they left with what? They left with the blessing of having to reunite with their families the day of judgment. Allah said that in Surah At-Tur, Ayah 21. آمنوا واتبعتهم ذريتهم واتبعتهم ذريتهم بإيمان ألحقنا بهم ذريتهم So this muhadar, inshallah ta'ala, and lecture will revolve around this particular point. And how is it that one can establish an upright household? What is a family? A family is who you originate from, who you come from. It is the people that you are around, the people who look out for your good and your interest. وَلِذَلِكَ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى He said وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ شِقَاقَ بَيْنِهِمَا If the wife and the husband have a, have a conflict and they don't come to terms and there's a mushkila, there's a problem between the two of them Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructed us and He said to us فَبْعَثُوا حَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهِ وَحَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهَا Bring from the woman's side and the man's side a, a, a ahl, family. If both of them, the man and the wife, both of them want to perfect the situation and the way they want to make the marriage work, if they want to bring good, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give them the tawfiq, the ability. Surah An Nisa, ayah 35. So here Allah tells us that when it happens, when it happens that the wife and the husband are not on, in agreement and they can't understand each other, but they really want this marriage to work, both of them want it to work, that they should go to who? A family member from his side and her side. These are the people who are looking out for your what? Your masalih. They're looking for your interest and your good. And the way that they're going to deal with this issue is the way that it should be. Because that's what the family do fil ghalibi the majority of the times. The person that the person, the people, ya ikhwa, a da'i, or a person who's practicing, the people that he should first start with to warn them, to benefit them, to advise them is his family members, his children, his relatives, is that he protects them from the hellfire. Allah says in the ayah, Ya ayyuh ladina amanu, those of you who believe, qu anfusakum, Save yourselves, وَأَهْلِكُمْ nara and your families from the hellfire, وَقُودُهَا النَّاسِ وَالْحِجَارَ The fire, it is lit with, okay, and the, uh, it's lit with humans and stones and rocks. عَلَيْهَا <laughs> مَلَائِكَةً Protecting the hellfire is angels, غِلَاضُ shidad. These angels are very strong and tough. They don't disobey Allah wa and they do as it's required from them. Walidalika Qatada said when it came to this ayah, Ibn Jarir al-Tabari brings the statement of Qatada. What does this ayah mean? 
He said, يَأْمُرُهُمْ He commands his family members بِطَاعَةِ اللَّهِ obeying Allah This is how he protects his family. This is the practical way of protecting your family. He commands them, his family, بِطَاعَةِ اللَّهِ The obedience of Allah وَيَنْهَاهُمْ And he prohibits them from and he stops them from عَنْ مَعْصِيَتِهِ The disobedience of Allah وَأَنْ يَقُومَ عَلَيْهِ بِأَمْرِ اللَّهِ And that he stands for them based on the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He stands up for his family's affairs. وَأَنْ يَقُومَ عَلَيْهِمْ بِأَمْرِ اللَّهِ Based on the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He commands them. وَيُسَعِدُهُمْ عَلَيْهِمْ He aids them in the obedience of Allah. He physically aids them. If they need something. If your family member can't drive, for instance, what do you do? You say, I will drive you, don't worry. You want to come to the masjid with me? Don't worry, you're going to come with me. I'll, I know it's, it's me going out of my way, but I will aid you and do that for you, inshallah ta'ala. فَإِذَا رَأَى مَعْصِيَةً And also the way Qatada mentions is that if he sees a ma'asiyah taking place in his household, his family members are doing it, what does he do? He stops them from it, he calls them away from it, and he warns them from it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He tells us about the prophets and the righteous people, that this is what they used to do. They used to call their people and they used to they call out their people they used to call their people to the obedience of Allah and to stay away from sins and they would do the same in their own households. Allah says subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa kana ya'muru ahlahu bis salati. He used to command his family members the prayer was zakati and he used to command them to give charity. Wa kana inda rabbihi mardiya. And with his Lord, he was one Allah was pleased with subhanahu wa ta'ala. Surah uh, Maryam, ayah 55. Also Allah tabarak wa ta'ala he told us to be patient with our families when we advise them and we call them to Allah. Allah says subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَأْمُرْ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ Command your family the prayer. وَاصْطَبِرْ عَلَيْهَا And be consistent and continuous in patience with them. Surah Taha, Ayah 132. And also the Ayah that talks about helping one another and aiding one another and supporting one another in what? In good families fall under that. Where Allah Tabarak wa Ta'ala He says in Surah Al Ma'idah, Wa ta'awanu ala al birri wa taqwa. Help each other in good, support each other in righteousness and steadfastness and piety. Wa la ta'awanu and do not help one with, do not help one another. Ala al ithmi wa al udwan, the disobedience of Allah and sins. Don't help each other on this. So the family fall under that. And as you all know, Nabiullah uh, Musa, what is it that he did? What is it Musa did? He made a dua. He said, وَجْعَلِّي وَزِيرًا مِّنْ أَهْلِي حَارُونَ أَخِي أُشْتُدْ بِهِ أَزْرِي وَأَشْرِكُ فِي أَمْرِي He wanted his brother to participate with him. And he wanted his brother to be part of those who get the reward of uh, conveying the message of Allah. But the scholars they say, Rahimahumullah, like Ibn Al-Qayyim and others, that there is no gift a person gave to another greater than what Musa gave to his brother Harun. He asked Allah for his brother to make him a prophet. And Harun received that manzila, that station of being a prophet based on the supplication of his brother. So then Anbiya and the Rusul, this is what they were to each other. That what did he want? وَتَعَاوَنُ عَلَى الْبِرِّ وَالتَّقْوَىٰ He wanted his brother to help him be good and participate in that good with him. وَلَا تَعَاوَنُ عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he told us, as an imam Ibn Hibban narrated in his sahih, al-Shaykh Nasir rahimahullah, he graded his hadith to be hasan in his kitab Jami' al-Saghir. Shaykh al-Bani rahimahullah, he authenticated that hadith which is that Allah has placed a responsibility over his slaves. And this hadith is the hadith of Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhuma that the Prophet said, Ala fakullukum ra'id Oh, people, every one of you is a shepherd. Every one of you is a shepherd. Everyone. Kullukum. The children are shepherds. The parents are shepherds. The brother is a shepherd. The sister is. The father is. The wife is. Everyone is. 
The hadith says, Ala kullukum ra'id, everybody is a shepherd. Wa kullukum mas'oolun ar-ra'iyati. And every single one of us is what? Is responsible over the flocks that he has been given. The flocks of sheep that you've been given, that you've been placed responsible, responsible over, you'll be questioned of it the day of judgment. Anas ibn Malik narrated, okay, the one Abdullah ibn Umar was Bukhari Muslim. Like in the Anas ibn Malik's wording one, is Anas ibn Malik's one is Ibn Hibban narrated it, and Sheikh Nasir narrated it to be Hassan, which is that, Inna Allah sa'ilun. Allah is going to question you, Kulla ra'in, everybody, Amma star'ahu, that which he has made him responsible over. Allah is going to ask everybody, because Allah made everybody a shepherd. And everybody is going to be asked about their flocks that they were given. Has he come with the responsibility that was upon him? Or did he forsake it? Until a man is asked about his family members. This means the husband. This means the brother. This means the son. It means everybody. A man will be asked. And ahli bayti, his family. So it's not just the wife that he'll be asked about. He'll be asked about his parents. He'll be asked about his brothers. He'll be asked about his family members. Jazakallah khairan. He'll be asked about all of that. And today, if we look towards our right, and we look towards our left, and we listen to the people's news, and the things that they bring us, we will realize that this issue is a sad reality. That the society is being destroyed. The society is being destroyed because of the deviation that has happened to the household. And so at a time like this, there's nothing greater uh, than speaking about this particular topic. The Sahabas who were young even realized the, realized the responsibility and that which was upon them. And they didn't forsake it. And they knew that what was upon them is to go back to their family and to guide them and to talk to them and to advise them and to teach them and educate them. And Imam al-Bukhari and Muslim both narrated on the authority of Abi Sulaiman, Malik ibn al-Huwayrith, radiallahu ta'ala an. Malik ibn al-Huwayrith was a young companion at this particular moment. He said, Atayna ila nabi we came to the Prophet of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa nahnu, and we were youngsters, we were youths, we were young. Mutaqaribuna, we were close in age. فَأَقَمْنَا عِنْدَهُ عِشْرِينَ يَوْمًا We stayed with the Prophet for 20 days وَلَيْلَةً and 20 nights. We stayed with him alayhi salatu wasalam. وَكَانَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ The Messenger was one who was رَحِيمًا رَفِيقًا He was very merciful. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was kind and merciful. The Messenger of Allah. فَلَمَّا ظَنَّ أَنَّا قَدْ اشْتَهِينَ أَهْلَنَا When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he came to realize and he came to see that his companions, Malik ibn al-Huayrith and the others who were with him, that they miss their families and that they want to somehow go back to their families. He asked us, سَأَلَّا عَمَّنْ تَرَكْنَا He asked us, who did you guys leave behind? From, who did we leave behind? And so we, we informed him, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the people that we left behind. And then the Prophet said, Irji'u, go back ila ahalikum, go back to your families, go back to your parents, go back to your brothers and your sisters, go back to your family members. Fa'aqimu fihim, and remain with them. Wa'allimuhum, and educate them about the religion. Teach them, Allahu Akbar. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he's mentioned the first point that we're going to mention soon insha'Allah ta'ala, which is to educate your family and to teach them. And he said, command them. Command them of that which Allah has made obligatory on them. So what is required from us is our youngsters today, our shabab of this particular time, ayaktadu bishabab al-sahaba, that we tread on the path of the noble companions, that we take their way and that the way they were, and that we feel the responsibility that Allah has placed upon us, that we feel there's a responsibility here, that, that we know Allah has placed a responsibility on us, and that Allah has honored us subhanahu wa ta'ala with this responsibility. And that Allah has honored us subhanahu wa ta'ala with, 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 with this responsibility. 
also that the man realizes the seriousness of this point which is to educate and to teach and bring knowledge the man should teach his wife should take time out to teach them and if he knows that teaching you will not be the best way for her to attain that knowledge then facilitate for her a place uh, an institute a halaqa in which she can come to and she can benefit and learn the deen from is very important and this is what you would find at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. so this inshallah brings me to my first point which is kayfiyah what is the way of protecting your family from the hellfire point number one that you give importance to teaching them the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the sunnah of the messenger alayhi salatu wasalam and that you also teach them anything important that they need the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he said in a hadith this hadith is found in sahih al-bukhari and imam al-bukhari brought it brought it under the chapter of Babu ta'alim al-rajul The man teaching his what? Amatahu teaching his slave girl and his family and his family under that chaptering Bukhari brought the following hadith the hadith of Abi Musa al-Ash'ari under the hadith of Abi Musa al-Ash'ari that the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he said thalathatun lahum ajarani three people Three types of people, they have two reward. They have what? They have two reward. And from the three, the Prophet mentioned, Rajulun kanat indahu amatun. From the three, the Prophet mentioned the one that concerns us now, which is a man who has a slave girl. فأدبها, he disciplined her. فأحسن تديبها, and he perfected the disciplinary that he took with her. وعلمها, he educated her. فَأَحْسَلَ تَعْلِيمًا He perfected the way he taught her. ثُمَّ أَعْتَقَهَا And then he frees her and does not keep her as a slave. فَتَزَوَّجَهَا And he marries her as a free woman with her own will. أَمَا He marries her off. فَلَهُ أَجْرَانِ He has two reward. This man has two reward. Ibn Hajar رَحِمَهُ اللَّهِ He says, because this hadith talks about what? Slave girl. This is talk about anybody other than that. So Imam Hafiz ibn Hajar and Bukhari's bab is different. The chaptering of Bukhari is what? The chaptering of Bukhari is um, the man teaching his slave girl and his family. And the hadith doesn't mention the family. So Hafiz ibn Hajar said, Mutabakat al hadith, the relationship between the hadith and the chaptering is that the hadith mentioned the ama, the slave girl, bin nasi textually. وفي الأهل بالقياس and the family fall under that by way of analogy قياس what type of قياس لكن قياس الأولى that this is more befitting if you do that for a slave girl then what about a family member that you do this for إذ الاعتلاء بالأهل because the importance that is given to the family الحرائر هو free في تعليم فرائض الله in teaching them the obligatory things of Allah and the sunan the uh, voluntary things is more important than, than the slave girl so this shows us what that the man teaching his wife and the man teaching his family members what does he attain from that he attains from that he gets two reward Imagine you taught your daughter, you educated her, you perfected her tarbiyah and the way you nurtured her and then you married her off to somebody. He married her and when, he, when, when you married her off, what happened? <coughs> you received two rewards from this based on the hadith. But the hadith teaches us something very powerful. That the ta'deeb, the discipline and the education is being separated from one another. The Prophet said, فَأَحْسَلَ تَأْدِيبَهَا He disciplines her and he educates her. And that shows that giving information 
and teaching the person information is not enough. What is also needed from the person is disciplining them, practically teaching them what to do or what not to do. You shouldn't drink with your right uh, left hand. You should drink with your right hand. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. Having a ta'deeb, disciplining them. Dhahak and maqatil, they both said, haqqud ala al-muslimi, the rights of a Muslim, the responsibility of a Muslim is that he teaches his family. He educates. One of the rights that the family members have on you is that you educate them. It's the huquq and the rights on the family, on a family member. That he educates them and he teaches them. And he even educates his slave girl. And if a slave boy, what does he teach them? Ma farad Allahu alayhi, that which Allah has made obligatory on them. وَمَا نَهَاهُمْ عَنْ And that which Allah prohibited them from. He teaches them that. There's no benefit. You go into halaqat. Not halaqat, but halaqat. You go to so many circles of knowledge. And you're going to so many places to learn. But your wife at home doesn't know how to pray. She doesn't know the ahkam al hayd wal nifas if it happens to her. She doesn't know anything. You've not taught her anything. You've not educated her. This is the rights that the wife has on you. And as you're going to see later, many people will say to you, I have family problems. And one of the reasons why they do is because the family were not nurtured upon knowledge. The wife would complain about her husband. You see, the, the wife is a student of knowledge. She's learning. She's taking the knowledge serious. But she keeps conflicting with her husband. And the reason why is because she's a student of knowledge. The way that she thinks, the way that she sees things, the way everything for her is qala Allah and qala Rasul. He isn't. So there's a problem here. The same is with the husband. He's going to circles. He's going to halaqat. He's going to heart softening places. He's going to Juma and jama'at. And his wife is at home. She's watching Bollywood. She's watching what? She's watching uh, Hollywood. She's watching TV. So what happens to him? When he goes home, your family's hearts are darkened and dull. So when you try to speak to them and you try to tell your parents and your family members, they're not willing to listen to you. The reason is because you've not sat down to teach them anything. You've not taught them anything. And so years have gone by. Allah tells the Quran, Alam ya'ni lilladina amanu an takhsha'a qulubuhum li dhikri Allah wa ma nazala min al-haqq wa la yakunu kalladina utu al-kitab min qablu fa ta'ala alayhim al-amadu fa qasat qulubuhum. The situation has become too long now. Ten years has gone by. فَقَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ Their hearts have become darkened and dull. Of course, now if you talk to them, it's going to be hard for you to get penetrated through to their head. And get to them. It's going to take years for you to bring back the darkness. Uh, take away the darkness from the heart and bring back a clean heart from them. Time is needed in return. So the man should teach his family. He should teach them the religion. وَلِذَلِكَ the Prophet والسلام, was known to even designate a time and a place for the women. A time and a place to teach them privately. Bukhari chapter in his Sahih. Babu, hal yaj'alu lil-nisa'i yawman ala hidatin fil ilmi. Bukhari chapter in Bab. Babu chapter. Hal yaj'alu lil-nisa'i. Does the man make for the wife? Am I the woman? Am I does a man make for a woman? Yawman a day ala hida, a separate day fil ilmi in knowledge, where the, he only teaches them. And then Abu Bukhari, when he asked that question, he brought the hadith to prove the answer to that question, which is the hadith of Abi Sa'id al Khudri. The women came to the Prophet, and they said, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ghalabana alayka al the men have taken all of your time from uh, of all your time. We've got nothing with you, O Messenger of Allah. All of your time is exerted towards the men. And we have nothing with you, O Messenger of Allah. You choose a day for us. Make a time that is for us. So the Prophet ﷺ, a particular day he reminded them. 
laqiyahunna fihi which he met them fawa'adahunna wa amarahunna he gave them a reminder and he also commanded them another riwayah by suhail ibn abi salih an abihi an abi huraira that the uh, story went by the story says mawidukunna that your promised place so he made a day for them and this riwayah mentioned that the prophet said that the place that you're going to be met is fi bayti fulanatin so and so's house inshallah that's the place i'm going to meet you all he said then the messenger came to them and so what did he do he gave them reminders alayhi salatu wasalam and he educated them so what did he do he made for them khassasa lahunna maw'idan zamaniyan wa makaniyan the prophet specified for the women a particular time and he specified for them what a particular place alayhi salatu wasalam abdullah ibn abbas said in a hadith and imam al-bukhari and muslim both narrated kharajtu ma'an nabiyya i went with the prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam kharajtu ma'an nabiyyi sallallahu alayhi wasallam i went with the prophet yawma fitr yawma fitr the day of fitr eid al-fitr or adha or maybe adha fasalla the prophet prayed he prayed the salah thumma khataba and then the prophet did a khutbah thumma ata an-nisaa then the messenger came to the women fawa'adahunna he reminded them so they shared with the men the general reminder he already gave that to them when the prophet did the khutbah who is that for the men and the women and then after that he came to them alayhi salatu wasalam fawa'adahunna he gave them a reminder wa dhakarahunna and he informed them wa amarahunna bi sadaqah he told them to give sadaqah hafiz ibn hajar the benefits that he took from his hadith is istihbab wa'd an-nisa that is recommended to place reminders with the women and to teach them the ahkam of islam and to remind them of bima yajibu alayhinna that which is obligatory on them and that the person urges them pushes them to give sadaqah that the women are told to give a lot of sadaqah and wa takhsisuhunna bidhalika and all of this is specified for them alone it's only for the women fi majlisin munfaridin in a gathering which is detached from any from the other from men just for them alone wa mahallu dhalika kullu but all of that he says it's in place ida aminat al fitna if there's no fitna that is scared of wal mafsada and corruption and harm will not come from it ida aminat al fitna if there's no fear of fitna and there is no fear of mafsada that it becomes that it becomes permissible but if there's fear of fitna and there's fear of mafsada then the hadith don't apply also it is upon the man and to ha yakuna rahma sadri his heart is open he takes the questions he accepts the questions he also even accepts i'tiraduhum this is your family members all of this i mentioned brothers it applies for you to give reminders to your family members your cousins your aunties your uncles all of these your female relatives your male relatives your family members all of you all of this is that the man when he's given a reminder ay yakuna rahma sadri your chest is open family members are strong in their statements they're tough in what they will say to you they'll say things to you that normal people won't say to you you get off your high horse you come down and you accept it from them they're not the ones who call you stand and sheikh and student of knowledge so the family members so when they talk to you they'll talk to you by your name they will discredit your efforts and your hard work and they won't take it serious so you're open the person is an open chest yastaqbil as'ilatahum you accept their questions some of their questions are not a question is i'tirad they just want to prove inconsistency in what you said you accept that your heart is open when you're answering that question that they put at you which is not a su'al min bab al-istifada from the angle of benefiting it's what i'rad to oppose you and to prove you wrong but the way that you respond to it is what bi wajhin bashush you smile when you answer it like it hasn't affected you in any way or form uh, any way uh, shape or form you accepted an example for this is 
أو مضى عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها ابن أبي مليكة السيد عائشة رضي الله تعالى عنها كانت لا تسمع الشيء لا تعرف إلا راجعت فيه عائشة would never hear something from the Prophet except he would question him but it wasn't it, it doesn't mean and I'm not saying that Aisha would do i'tirad of the Prophet kalla thumma kalla that's not what I'm saying but what she would do is that she would ask when he said something if she say, if he said something other than what he said here that she didn't understand she would relate the two where other people may be shy of saying that to the Prophet alayhi salatu wasalam but Aisha would have the courage to say that to her, her husband the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasalam anything she didn't understand she would ask so the Prophet sallallahu one day said in her gathering man husiba anybody who is accounted and accountability is placed on them عذب, it will be punished if Allah accounts you then you're going to be what? عذب, you're punished Aisha went quiet and she said awalaysa yaqulullahu ta'ala doesn't Allah say فَسَوْفَ يُحَاسِبُ فَسَوْفَ يُحَاسَبُ حِسَابًا يَسِيرًا Didn't Allah say that they're going to be accounted, a accounting which is easy. Didn't Allah say that? So how is that everybody who is accounted, who is being uh, judged, is going to be punished? How could that happen? She didn't see how they, they, they could go together. And we explain this in details in Surah 2. Al Inshiqaq, where it's in, ayah 8. We explained it in our tafsir sessions. But the Prophet gave her the answer. What did he say? He said, Inna ma al ard, Aisha. The ayah that you're talking about, Fasofa yuhasabu hisaba yasira. Here it means al ard, when it's been presented to them. Walakin man nuqisha udib. But the one who is being told, What did you do here? What did you, why did you do this? Why did you, okay, why did you do this? This person is being punished by the question. The question is destroying this person. This person is being destroyed. So look at Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. The Prophet didn't say, how dare you, are you trying to say I'm contradicting myself? I'm a messenger of Allah, I don't contradict myself. He didn't say that to her. He explained it for her, alayhi salatu wasalam. I educated her in that regard. So the person should be one who is open for his family's points and they don't say to them when they speak to you, I, was, I spoke about it all day, you didn't hear what I said? Repeat it again for them. If what you were saying in the lecture, five, ten minutes, you were giving them a reminder. And then within that, they ask you a question that you've already established. Don't say, what are you listening? This is an opportunity. You should be the most welcoming person. Or else they're going to run away. Or if they ask you a question that you see to be very simple and easy, you say, really? Really blame yourself, don't blame them. And my family members are asking me, whether you should read Fatiha in the Salah or not. Rather blame yourself that your family is at that point and you're at the point where you're studying Bukhari and Muslim. It's embarrassing. So don't blame them. Teach them. And it should actually hurt you. It should actually hurt you. They used to say that if my brother ever came and asked me for finance, they would actually cry because they believed that the, uh, my brother should have, re should have reached a point where he would need to ask me. Why did I understand that my brother was in need? The family members reaching a point where they need to ask him questions like, is Fatiha something we have to read in the Salah? Is actually something that makes you sad. That you didn't realize that your family's knowledge is at this level. The fact that they had to ask you that question shows you you did not take the responsibility on yourself to go out there and to educate them and teach them. So the person that should be blamed is yourself. وَلِذَلِكَ The Sahabas would educate their families even at their last moments. Look what Umar said to his son. When he's, sorry, his daughter, daughter, Hafsa, when she cried and she saw her father, Umar radiallahu anhu dying, and she cried and then Umar said, Mahlad, calm down. My daughter, calm down. Alam ta'alim ata'alami. Did you not know? Did you not know of Anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam aqal that the messenger said, Inna al mayyita that the dead yu'adhabu bibuka'i ahlihi alayhi that the dead, the deceased, will be punished on the crying of his family, the wailing that they come with. The deceased will be punished for it. And this hadith has an explanation, which is that if the man used to teach his family 
And he used to say to them, if I die and I pass away, then it's upon you to wail over me. If, if that's what he used to say, then he will be punished for that. Every time they cry, he will get a punishment for it. As for if he didn't call them to it, then other people's sin would not be placed on his scale. As Allah said in the Quran, وَلَا تَزِرُ وَازِرَةٌ وِزِرَ أُخْرَى That a person does not take the wrongdoing of another person. Unless though, he played a role in this person's wrongdoing. It will be added to the, uh, your scale. So the person, brothers, should teach his family, educate them, teach them the Book of Allah, the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I'm going to finish at this particular point by speaking about what are the things that a person should teach his family. Number one, Al-Qur'an. You should teach them the Qur'an. What is it that you should make them learn from the Qur'an? At least the bare minimum that you should teach your family member, your mother, your father, your auntie, your uncles, your family your wife, your children is the Book of Allah. But the bare minimum that you need to teach them is that which they can pray their salah with. I can promise you all, if you go back to your family members and you sit with them and you have conversation, you might come across some family members who don't even know Surah Al-Fatiha. That's the sad reality. That some of us may stand, st see a family member who doesn't actually know Surah Al-Fatiha. I've seen aunties, Somali aunties who said to me, I was married to my husband for so long and we, I never learned how to pray the Salah. No one ever taught me it. No one ever taught her it. The old generation, the old Somali generation, they weren't taught the prayers. And the knowledge wasn't taught to them. The Somali, the awakening that you see, that hijab and whatnot, and salah and ibadah, started after the 90s properly. But before that, if some of the elderly, grandparents especially, if you sit with them and you ask them questions, some of them you realize they, want, they don't even read Fatiha in the Salah. They just say, SubhanAllah, 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 SubhanAllah. And I came across elderly people who are like that, who are not taught. They never went, no madrasa, no Quran. Because in our country, before the 90s, uh, the country was run by a communist leader and religion was fought against. It wasn't allowed. So people didn't need to learn. The point here is, the point is, see your family members. Some of them you realize that when you sit with them, some family members, when you sit with them, even if they read Fatiha, it's to a mustawa, it's to a level that isn't even accepted like this. If you go on YouTube, there's a video that people are being asked Fatiha. In Egypt, it's in Egypt, Arab country, they've been asked about Fatiha and they don't know it. They don't know, they don't know the Prophet salatu, who is he? They know his name. They've been asked, Nabi like Muhammad was his name. They can't answer it. That video is on YouTube. So you see a lot of us have these issues. I remember an elderly woman came to me one time. She came to me and she said to me, I did not know that you can't have intimacy whilst you're in your menses. I didn't know that. Ma kuntu arifu dhalik. You didn't know that? No, I didn't know that. In this country. So I never knew that. I didn't. So I'm telling you, when you sit down, you teach your family so much things is going to come clear to you. You're going to see a lot. Make them memorize the Quran. But how much of the Quran should you make them memorize? The amount that they need to pray their salah first. If that becomes achieved and accomplished, then you move on to what's next. You add more onto them. But that is the bare minimum that is needed. Look what Allah said in the Quran. وَذْكُرْنَا مَا يُتْلَى فِي بُيُوتِكُنَّ مِنْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَذْكُرْنَا Remember that which used to be recited in your household, Nabi Allah Muhammad. What is it? مِنْ آيَاتِ اللَّهِ The verses of Allah. The Quran is what should be, what is recited and is read in the household. And the hikmah here is the sunnah of the Messenger alayhi salatu wassalam. Wal-hikmah, he has sunnah. The hikmah is the sunnah. Your household should be a household where the Quran and the Sunnah is being read in. Not music and films. So it takes us to the second thing. What is the second thing that a person should do? The second thing that a person should do is take the 40 hadith of Imam al nawawi The 40 hadith of Imam al nawawi What should you do? He explains this book to his family. And urge your family members to memorize it. Gift them based on it. Say, if you memorize this, I promise I'll give you this. 
Anyone who memorized, oh, this, is, this is the gift for them. Push your family members, whether it be your wife, whether it be your children, whether it be, push them to memorize this. Promise them that if they do memorize this, you will do something for them. I will take you out for a holiday. I'll do this for you. I'll do that for you. Make them do it. And place a sharah on it for them. That book is very important. The third thing is al-aqidah. Teach your family aqidah. Teach your family aqidah. And the best book to teach them is 200 questions. That is written, it's called Mi'atay Su'al wa Jawab fil aqidah. 200 questions and answers in aqidah. And it's written by Hafid al-Hakami rahimahullah. Hafid al-Hakami rahimahullah, he wrote a book, it's 200 questions on aqidah issues. Questions and answers are on there. Both of them are on there. You sit down and you give them. You take 10 questions every day, you ask them it. When they cannot answer the question, then you say, this is the answer. 10 questions every day. You ask them the question, they give up. And then you tell them that you, this is the answer for it. If they answer it, have something to give to the one who answers it. Have something. So what do you do? Teach them question and answers. And this way, it's very interactive. Then if you take one book and you go through it, this is interactive. You get their input and you ask them when they answer the question, what made them think that this was the answer to the question? What made them think that? Find their mind what they're thinking of and what's making them do this. Mm. Okay, now take this answer, inshallah ta'ala, and teach them it. And try to teach them to take notes. Make them try to take notes. Majority of the family members will choose to just listen. Don't worry. Do it. Do it in that way. It's better than nothing. It's better than nothing. If they refuse to take notes and they don't want to do that, then at least if you just get 10 questions through with them, that's a ni'mah min Allah. As time goes on, you see them carrying papers and pens. Also, the fourth is al-fiqh. Teach them fiqh. And start with al-tahara and salah. Al-tahara and al-salah. Teach them how to do tahara and how to pray the Salah. The book I will tell you to use is for Salah is Sheikh Nasr's Kitab, Sifat al-Salat al-Nabi. The way you do it is you don't take the book, you don't open it, Inna alhamdulil, you don't do that. You take it and you break it down, simplify it. Very simple. You go through each point pertaining to the Salah. And if you can actually physically do it for them, it's even better. Are we all together? And you do, you ask them. And what is even better is that if you actually ask them, what should I do here? And they tell you. And you make it interactive in that way. And so they say to you, this is what you should do. And what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? What do you think? When you listen to all of them, you're right, you're wrong, and do it like that. To, in, to uh, make it an interactive session is the best. This is definitely good for them in the sense where the reason why many family members watch TV and they speak on the phone for too long is because no one's taking this time. They don't know how what to do with the time. Also, what you need to teach them if there are women, you need to speak to them about the ahkam al hijab. Talk to them ahkam of hijab. Are we all together? Well, it's a it's a painful reality. That once the woman's taken off the hijab, you bring her to the sheikh and say, Sheikh, my wife is not listening. She's, but she's been working towards that. Are we all together? She's been working towards that. The same is with the wife. If the wife is more knowledgeable than the husband, it's not a problem that she teaches him as well. Huh? She teaches him the things that are for him. So the man, what does he talk to the woman about the hijab? He talks to her to about the zina, beautification. What's the ahkam pertaining to beautify yourself? Ahkamul Hayd wa Nifas, menses, and when it happens, what should she do? What she, what she, what should she not do? Her postnatal bleeding, all of that. He talks to all of those ahkam. She needs, to, he, she, he needs to educate her on it. The fifth is wala tuhmil durus sira. Don't dismiss sira. Sira is that story that will fill the family. Taking the Prophet's biography, everybody loves to hear stories. I can reassure you this one would be the most, inter the most enjoyable one for them. 
if you know the story properly and you've understood it and you go through the Prophet's life and as every time you get an opportunity whatever point you think the family are lacking you stress on it from the seerah and you keep it moving the seerah helps a lot and it will enhance them especially the children especially your little nephews and nieces and your children they love stories and if you tell them about a story they will sit down and they will listen <coughs> so you do that also you do al wa'd wa tadkir you have sessions where it's heart softening it's reminders you talk to them about heart touching matters jannah nar you speak to them about you talk about the adab al qabr you speak to them about reflections of the hereafter you bring that to them to heart to soften their hearts this is very very important and if you know that you as an individual cannot get through to your family and you teaching them they're not going to take it from you then you should facilitate somebody she would they will listen to this is very important sometimes the wife may not enjoy listening to you she know she may not like your dus the parents may not like you listening to you and what you have to say but there's a sheikh in the language who if you bought that tape for them and you put it on they will listen to it they will listen to it he can get to them it will make their heart soften and that is beneficial for them you'd find that in the urdu language you'll find that in the somali language you'll find that in the arabic language you will find that that family members would listen to a particular speaker just buy that tape of that speaker and giving it to them say so listen to that speaker is one of the ways that helps especially if they if you put it on for them whilst they're in the kitchen they're cleaning they're doing things you do that and this brothers is also more important in the noble month of ramadan where the wives spend a lot of time which they shouldn't but they spend a lot of time in the kitchen and cooking and making food and iftar suhoor and etc that particular month there's no time more important for a man to then bring a cassette or a tape of a sheikh who at least she gets a source of iman increase from that while she's working on the house and while she's cleaning the second thing that inshallah ta'ala a man needs to do to save his family the first one was what to educate them and to teach them the book of allah and the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and all of these things the second one is ilzamun bi ada'i al-fara'id wa mutaba'atun fiha that you have a method where you keep track of them following the obligatory things you don't just tell them it you don't just inform them about allah said this and the messenger said that but you have set yourself a way where you're going to make sure that you check up if they're actually doing what is obligatory on them especially la siyam as-salah especially the prayer if a husband is married he has to have if he knows his wife is huh, she's laxidaisiku she's negligent of the prayer then that's what he needs to do if you have family members who are like that this is what you need to take on yourself that you observe their salah you give an extra look to it you don't dismiss it after you've informed them of it and you say oh i've done what was upon me if you want your family to come with you to jannah and reunite with you you don't say that is that what you say are you going to watch your help your family go to the hellfire don't watch them so make sure that when you told told taught them about the salah so you're educating them here and you also are what you're also observing them and you're doing muraqaba of their situation you're also observing how they pray the salah after you taught them it are they applying what you taught them are they following the arkan are they following the shurut the conditions the prerequisites that were required from them the wajibat and the sunan are they following it are they coming with the salah at its time are they praying especially salatul fajr you see many brothers who are supposedly meant to be students of knowledge lakinnahum la yusalluna salat al fajr ala waqtiha they don't pray fajr on its what on its correct time and if that is the case what is making it is the bed that you're sleeping on or something like that then it's upon you at this particular moment to what to go in a situation that you know is going to make you wake up for the salah 
I said this to you before, brothers. Ya ikhwa, a student of knowledge, it is not just upon him to pray Fajr on time. A, student, a person who is practicing the deen, you have to have Qiyamul Layl and pray your night prayer and have the khayr to do at night when Allah Taala comes down. If you're lackadaisical in your Fajr, then what do you expect from your family members? What do you expect from your family members? Faqidu shay'in la yu'ti. All of this I'm saying to you, if they see you at night sleeping through Fajr, what are they going to think to themselves? What are they going to take serious of what you're saying? And when you say my family are not practicing, maybe they're not practicing because they don't see the religion in you, Aslan. They don't even see you to be a serious person. You only bring out the religion as a card when you need it, to bully the families with it. Fear Allah, switch this off, switch that off. But you as an individual, لا صلة بالإسلام. There's no relationship between you and an Islam. صح? Other than using it against the family members. So it's upon us, brothers, that people see Islam has actually changed you. That everybody will desire to be like that. Your family members will respect you for what you're doing. They'll respect you for your effort and your hard work. When they see you studying seriously, when they see you praying the salah on its timing, having not, not needing anyone to come to you and tell you the salah is this time, that you're, mashallah, steadfast in your prayer. It's very important. Then your family members will take the fiqh class that you're giving serious and the seerah class that you're giving serious and the wa'ad and the tadkir that you're doing, they're going to look at you and say, Allahu Akbar, he's taken it. And it has made him the way he is right now. So we all want that. We all want that. And it's sad because a lot of parents, they come to you and they'll say to you, the day my child started to practice, the day that my child started to practice is the time he became worse. It was better the days when he wasn't practicing. Inna lillahi wa inna ila raj'un. Wallahi, some parents have said that to me. He has bad manners now. He's angry all the time. He's always looking down at people now that he's started to practice. Okay? Before was so soft boy, he was a Rahim, he was layin, he was Rafiq, kind. He understood our situation, he would cry with us, he would feel our pain. Now, he's looking down at everybody. Your family members should see you more softer than before. But naam, this time you don't tolerate what you used to tolerate from the muharramat and the wrong. That doesn't mean you become hard. That doesn't mean you become hard. Sheikh Abd Aziz ibn Baz, a story was mentioned regarding him. Taghammadahu Allahu bi rahmatih. May Allah place over Sheikh Abd Aziz ibn Baz his mercy. If a person had a dars, عنده درس في المسجد بعد صلاة الفجر. If a person had a lesson in the masjid after Salat al-Fajr, فخرج إلى الصلاة and he went to the salah and his family were sleeping. هل يجب عليه أن يرجع إلى البيت? Is it upon him to go back to his house to wake up his family, even if part of the dars is missed? Or the lesson in totality, he misses it. Or should he just sit in the lesson? This question was put to who? A Sheikh Abdul Aziz Mubaz. A man left his wife sleeping. Okay, he has a lesson after Fajr. So he goes to Fajr for the prayer. Should he sit down after Fajr and listen to his dars? Or should he actually go back to his family members and actually wake them up for Fajr? Knowing that there are family who don't pray the salah ala waqtiha and whatnot. Did he go back and wake his family up? Okay. Even that though some of the deaths will miss him, or even all of the less will miss him. What should he do in this situation? Abd Aziz ibn Baz alayhi rahmatullah said, Bali yajibu alayhi ayarja. It's upon him to go back. Lianna amra ahlahu. Because him commanding his family in salah is wajib. And coming to the lesson is mustahab. It's recommended. You shouldn't give precedence to the recommended over the wajib. Upon him is to go back to wake his family up. So here is very important. That a person has a dars. He's learning, he's studying, he's coming to halaqa. And in that halaqa, what is he? What is he learning? Ahkam of Allah, halal and haram. 
But his family members at home, they're very lackadaisical, negligent of salah, they don't pray. He left them sleeping. Should he go back to wake them up before the time finishes? Or should he just watch, uh, listen to the dars? Shaykh Abd al-Aziz ibn Abbas said what he said. So what does that show us? That shows us that this is a serious matter. وَلِذَلِكَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he praised Nabiullah Ismail. What did he say about him? إِنَّهُ كَانَ صَادِقَ الْوَعْدِ He was one who was truthful about his promise. وَكَانَ رَسُولًا نَبِيًّا And he was a prophet and a messenger from Allah. And this is a time Allah is praising Nabiullah Ismail. Allah is praising him. Look what he mentions in the things that he's praising him for. He said, وَكَانَ يَأْمُرُ أَهْلَهُ بِالصَّلَةِ He used to command his family the salah. وَالزَّكَاةِ He would take time out to command his family to pay the zakat. وَكَانَ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِ مَرْضِيًّا And he was towards his Lord, what? He was towards his Lord, one who was pleasing. وَلِذَلَكَ Some of the ulama, they mentioned that this ayah has a very powerful understanding in it. Look what Allah said, وَذْكُرْ فِي, وذكر في, وذكر في الْكِتَابِ إسماعيل. Like remember in the book Ismail, إِنَّهُ كَانَ صَادِقَ الْوَعْدِ وَكَانَ رَسُولَ النَّبِيَّ Allah first of all said, He was a person who fulfilled His covenant and His promise. What is the biggest promise that everybody has made? <coughs> وَإِذْ أَخَذَ اللَّهُ ميثاق. Allah says, when Allah took a mithaq and a covenant with everybody, which was what? أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَى شَهِدْنَا أَن تَقُولُوا يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ إِنَّا كُنَّا عَنْ هَذَا غَافِلِينَ that the biggest promise and the biggest wa'ad that we all made was that we were going to take Allah, Allah is our, uh, as our Lord and they were going to obey Him, we we're going to follow His command and stay away from His prohibition. So Ismail was one who fulfilled the covenant and the promise he made with Allah. So he was a good person first of all. And then after that, what did Allah say? But if you're breaking the promise that you made with Allah, can you command your family a salah and zakat? Yeah? You can't. They won't take it from you. As the Arabs say, فَاقِدُ شَيْءٍ لَا يُعْطِي One who doesn't have can't give. If you don't have it yourself, then you can't give. وَلِذَلِكَ Nabi Allah Shu'ayb, what did he say to his, uh, his people? What did he say to his people? When he commanded them, he said, وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَنْ أُخَالِفَكُمْ إِلَى مَا أَنْهَاكُمْ عَنْ He's talking to his family members, he's talking to his fa- uh, people that he was sent to. I don't want to oppose you guys in what I command you. I want to set an example. I know I'm calling you guys to Allah said and His Messenger, but I'm never going to do behind your backs what I prohibit. So these are examples and things that are needed. One of the things that you find is that Hajj is obligatory on the family member and Umrah is obligatory on the family member. And you see a brother who goes Umrah on the regular basis. He's going Umrah and his family have never done Umrah. And there's no reason for it, other than the fact they can't be bothered to take his family out. To Hajj and Umrah, these are wajibat. If you're not going to take them, if they don't see you going out of your way to pay for the Hajj and their Zakat, and you're not going to do that for them, and when it comes to Umrah, then would they take it serious when you say Salah to them? These are things, yeah, ikhwan, that when they look at they will take serious. That you, are you paying for my Umrah? Are you, are you, are you, of course I am, it's wajib upon you. I have to help you with the wajibat. You just say that to her. What's that going to stick with her? Your family members, they're going to look at you and say, SubhanAllah, he's taking the wajibat very serious. It's very important. What is also important is that the person places time to what? Before I go into that, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why did, why did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa legislate and make a sunnah to pray the voluntary prayers in the house and the wajibat in the masjid the prophet told us the hadith he said do not make your households a graveyard why what's a graveyard a graveyard is, is prohibited for you to pray inside it right don't make your houses a place where deed is deserted from it your children are going to see daddy pray in sunan. Your wife is going to see it. Your family members are going to see it. They're going to know you're a person who prays. Even though you pray the wajibat in the masjid. But even some sunan here. Some sunan here. 
Also, another example is that if a husband is sending his wife over the country and the, everywhere without a mahram, he goes, go, travel without a mahram. And he's not exerting effort to find a mahram for her to take her somewhere. He tells her, travel where, you, no problem, travel. I travel, inshallah. You can travel where you want. And then later he says to her, why don't you fear Allah? He says, would you listen? You couldn't take it upon yourself to pay for an extra ticket from my mahram in a situation that I'm in. How am I going to take it serious that you take Allah's ahkam serious? Are we together, ikhwah? Nobody will take what you say serious. So what does the person have to do? The person has to make sure that they exert every effort that they have to their family members when it comes to this. That don't travel, I will put in place for you mahrams. Naam, parents generally don't listen. And uh, they won't listen if they don't want it. And some aunties and uncles, and but try your best to say, I'll do this for you. I'll put all of this in place for you. Then at least, if it doesn't work based on what you've exerted and effort that you put in, your family knows that you tried. And that's what you wanted. Are we all together? But if, you're, if your family member looks at your mom looks at you and says, Oh, I can't travel because of a mahram. Or your wife says, I can't travel because of a mahram. You say, no problem, inshallah, just travel, inshallah. Because you can't be bothered to pay for the extra ticket or uh, whatever the case may be. Sahya ikhwa. Then anything that you say after that, will it be taken serious? It won't be taken serious. I'll stop there, inshallah, ta'ala, to take some questions and answers. Anything which I have said wrong or incorrect is from me, shaytan, and Allah and His Messenger are free from it. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik ashadu wa la ilaha illallah astaghfiruhu wa atubu ilayhi